Hello everyone, and welcome back to The Bleeding Effect, a podcast where we venture back in time through Assassin's Creed history. Lean back into the animus and join us. I am one of your hosts, Jarrett. And I am Tiffany. And today we're doing a special, um, because today is a special day in history, especially for us assassins, but also in um, real history too. Yeah. As you know, Assassin's Creed based on real history. It's the Ides of March. What, pray tell, is the Ides of March? It is the 15th day of the month of March. And we're going to get into the story behind why this is such a mysterious day. I don't mean to say that the 15th of March is cursed. So if your birthday's on March the 15th, I'm not saying anything's bad about it. It's only bad for one person in particular who we're going to talk about today. <laughs> yeah, it's cursed. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Move over Friday the 13th. We got a new day for you. Mm-hmm. March 15th. Now, me and my friend, who are super nerds, always celebrate it in our own way. We always say, like, you know, happy Ides on the 15th, and then we'll send, like, Caesar memes back and forth to each other. Because we're nerds, and that's what we do. And we're both, like, history people, so that's the weird stuff that historians do when they're bored, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> quoting the Shakespeare and everything. Oh, I'm, I'm totally going to loop you in on it this year. We're going to send them to you as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was thinking, what? where's that? There's that Shakespeare quote, and I don't know if it's from this play or if it's from, like, Richard III. I think it's Richard III, the one that's like, my kingdom for a horse, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Yeah, that's Richard. No. Another. You failed Shakespeare, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> we actually didn't cover Richard III in high school. We covered... Um, Julius Caesar. Yeah, we did too. And Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, that was boring. And I think that was it, honestly. Uh, I got to do The Taming of the Shrew, which was actually pretty fun, because it's a comedy. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like, it's as fun as you can get with, like, Shakespeare, because even then it's just kind of like, yay. Well, (laughs) I like Shakespeare a lot. I like, I think I like Hamlet the best. Oh, yeah, we did Hamlet too. uh, They kept talking about Macbeth, and I was like... I didn't get to do that one. Uh, okay, because Shakespeare has two characters. Shakespeare has Queen Mab, who's like the queen of the fairies. And so I get confusing Queen Mab. I don't... Isn't that queen from, Mab from isn't the, the... Midnight Summer? Yeah, Midnight Summer. That's the like a love story. The fairy queen in there is Titania. Oh. And um, cause many fairy I know that because actually if you watch... Um, I don't know if I should say... Okay, brief spoiler warning. For any of you planning on watching Gargoyles, they feature, like, a lot of Shakespearean characters in there. They feature Puck and um, Titania and Oberon, who were um, mm-hmm. three prominent fairies from Midnight Summer's Dream. Yes. Midnight... Uh, wait, Midsummer Night's Dream. Midsummer's... Did I say Midnight Summer's Dream? Yes. Midsummer Night's Dream. We Same totally thing. are nailing this. <laughs> yeah. And um, I know those... Okay, we did cover that in high school because we watched the movie... Um, the one with, uh, uh, I keep forgetting his name, Batman. Oh, Christian Bale? Christian Bale. That one's great. It, yeah. I love that one. Mm-hmm. Where he's, is, he's, he's not Demetrius, is he? I think he is. I don't remember. Yeah. He's very dreamy. It's in great. One. There's a lot of, like, in, like, the early 2000s and late 90s, there's a lot of, like, actors who ended up becoming very famous, that are very famous now, doing, like, random Shakespeare and it's, like, the funniest thing ever. Like, I was just watching one where Keanu Reeves and um, oh, Denzel Washington are, play brothers. And it's so great. And I forget which play it is. But it just, and I don't know if they're supposed to be half-brothers because I'm not super familiar with that particular play. But I'm just like, um, you guys are not brothers. Maybe, like, you know, brothers, but you're not brothers. <laughs> It's great. And then, like, Keanu Reeves is, like, the evil brother who's plotting against Denzel Washington, who's the really good, really nice brother. So, in order to do this, he tries to sabotage Denzel Washington's best friend's marriage in the story. And it's great. You should totally but, watch this. But what, which one I can't one remember was, which one it is. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. Let me look it up really fast. I guess I gotta okay. find it. Because I feel weird saying, watch this, but also I don't know what it's called. Right. Um, but I was trying to say... Um, no, there's another... Okay, Queen Mab is hinted at in Romeo and Juliet because they talk about, like, how she's kind of like a... I don't know. Mercutio, right? Romeo, Romeo's best friend. It's Much Ado About Nothing. Okay. 1993 British-American romantic comedy film. Okay. 
I know that's one of the titles of the Shakespeare play, but I can honestly say I have not seen or heard all of the Shakespeare plays. Mm -hmm. Because, okay. So, yeah, she's... So, where Mercutio goes on a rant when, um... This is, like, when they're when they're thinking about... I think... I don't know if they're lusting after, like, women or something. They're going on the streets before he sees... They're talking about crashing the party and everything. And then um, Mercutio is, like, uh, so excited and full of joy. And then he starts talking about Queen Mab. And then he's, like, gets really angry and goes, like, bipolar for a second. And, like, Romeo's like, oh, are you okay there? And he's like, oh, it's nothing. You know? <laughs> it's like, you're scaring me right now. <laughs> but he went on this long rant about Queen Mab. That's what I was right. trying I to say now. was... Uh, um, Macbeth, I kept getting confused with Queen Mab, and I was like, is Macbeth about a fairy queen? And then mm-hmm. I went and I watched Macbeth, and I was like, oh, Macbeth is about um, that Scottish um, usurper. Yes. So it was a lot more interesting. No fairies in that one. <laughs> I feel like that's the bloodiest play, maybe. I think it is, yeah. Like, um, close to Hamlet. But Do you remember that Adam's Family movie, like the first one? That scene that they're doing on their stage play for their school, that's a scene from Macbeth. Oh, where they okay. have like the blood packets and it's like I thought it spurting out into like the audience. Hamlet because like there's that whole. Fun no, it's the scene thing. from Macbeth that they're doing, which is like this is super appropriate for elementary school, <laughs> which is what the great thing about the Adams family. <laughs> well, very well done, um, but yeah, Scotland has like a bloody history, so I, I think they did that justice. Yeah, I just like um, they pretty much talk about how. Um, this is going to become a Shakespeare episode. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. Forget about the Ides of March. This is the Shakespeare 101, guys. We're going back to English class in the ninth but grade. pretty much, you'll see, like, a sharp contrast between, like, you have, like, Calpurnia, who's Julius Caesar's wife, and how she's concerned and scared for him and everything. And, like, then you have Macbeth's wife, who's, like, Macbeth's, like, I don't know if I can murder my best friend in cold blood, and she's just, like fucking grow up here. Mm-hmm. You're gonna you know? do it. You're gonna do it right now. <laughs> yeah, she literally says the quote from Shakespeare, which is, screw your courage to the sticking place. Um, which I think is insinuating, like, grow up here. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's um, what, what they're... She's like, man, if yeah. I only had balls. <laughs> yeah. So, Give me that knife. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it myself. Yeah. Um... So, yeah, Shakespeare. But, okay, <laughs> the other thing I was going to talk about was, I think that's now my favorite Shakespeare play. Um, Macbeth? Yeah, uh, because, like, <clears throat> and the funny thing is, it's, like, the the cheesy line that you get, like, every Halloween from, like, the witches. Witches always say, double, double, uh, toe trouble. trouble. <laughs> and I was, like, I was, like, I, I don't even know where that's from. But then, like, I watched Macbeth, and I was, like, oh, okay, these are the original Wicked Witches, the mm-hmm. three... Uh, they're not, sisters. Yeah, they're not weird sisters. Or not weird sisters. Like, they're not the sisters of fate. Mm-hmm. But, um... And it they're not directly called witches. Yeah. So, but yeah. Yeah, that's where, like, the, all like that the imagery comes hags, from. Yeah. Well, basically, if you go into, like, a lot of the Shakespeare stuff, a lot of, like, phrases and stuff that we say and, like, all kinds of references that we have today come from, like, these plays. I don't think any in particular come from uh, Julius Caesar, besides, Mm -hmm. like, the famous et tu brute, which we will get into. Mm -hmm. But we digress. Let's get into the assassination of Julius Caesar. And, yes, I'm going to start you off with some uh, uh, lines from the play. So this comes from Act 1, Scene 1. It is where Caesar uh, meets the soothsayer who is going to tell him to beware what's coming to him. Which ones am I reading? Oh, uh, if he wants... How about... Because there's three people... Well, no, there's four people here. We have Caesar, we have the soothsayer, we have Casca, and we have Brutus. So, I'll be the soothsayer and Casca if you want to be Caesar and Brutus. Okay. All right. Caesar! Oh, me? Yeah. <laughs> ha! Who calls? Bid every noise be still. Peace yet again. Have to establish that's Costco. Sorry, that's Costco, by the way. <laughs> Caesar. Okay, Caesar again. Who is it in the press that calls on me? I hear a tongue, shriller than all the music. Oh, cry Caesar. Speak, Caesar, is turned to hear. Caesar, <clears throat> beware the eyes of March. Caesar, what man is that? Brutus. Everything Brutus? Yep. Mm-hmm. 
A soothsayer bids you to beware the Ides of March. Caesar. Set him before me. Let me see his face. Cassius. Fellow, come from the throng. Look upon Caesar. Caesar. What sayest thou to me now? Speak once again. Soothsayer. Beware the Ides of March. Caesar. He is a dreamer. Let us leave him. Pass. So this is a scene that Shakespeare adds into the story to tell Caesar. This is towards the end of his days, whenever he is being warned that someone is out to get him and something bad is about to happen to him. So today we cover one of the most heavily depicted assassinations in Italian history, the death of Julius Caesar that occurred on 44 BCE on the 15th of March. He was 55 years old at the time. Caesar's death and execution has been depicted in many ways, most often portraying him as a victim of the old system's ways. So today, since it's the 2000th and 64th anniversary of this most famous assassination, let's delve further into the story to find out what happened. Why was he assassinated? Who wanted him dead? And what was the consequences of his death? So Julius Caesar, he was a Roman consul and had served in this role from 59 BCE to 58 BCE, also from 48 to 47, 46, 45, and 44, many years. So what exactly is a Roman consul? A Roman consul is one of the highest um, of the ordinary magistries. I say one because usually in the Roman Empire, two leaders would be elected into this position to help balance the use of power and keep one another in check. The role was created to eliminate uh, the previous system of kings who were born into absolute power. Now, with a consul, you had a temporary elected position which one had to earn and was open to anyone allegedly. Um, however, only those from the ruling ol oligarchy system, who are known as the patricians of Rome, would ever be able to take on these roles. Though there were multiple attempts to stop this from happening, to interrupt this old system, as consuls, men like Caesar commanded the army they convened and presided over the Senate and the popular assemblies, and they were also present at, uh, represented the state in foreign affairs. They also oversaw the court system and the development and execution of laws. So basically, they were a king, except where there were two. It was split into two people doing the same role, and they were directly controlled by the Senate. Like, kind of like Sparta. Yes, yeah, very similar system. Because the idea came from, like, the, you know, the Greek idea of democracy and having representation. So now you have elected positions that are being used and you don't have direct kings that are in charge of everything. Uh, one of Rome's biggest fears since the very start of this political system has been the return of kings. Even though the political structure was not perfect and obviously had its own corruption and nepotism going on for the ruling class in particular, they were quite happy with the system that they had. Most politicians were directly involved in the army and had their own units that they could call upon on command. When, and then they would also push the regions of Rome even further, expanding this empire. When a consul conquered an area for Rome, they often got a pretty decent cut of the area to keep and benefited off of uh, even after leaving their office. One of the things that would uh, be become both a great benefit as well as a detriment to Caesar was that the troops at this time were more loyal to their leaders than they were to the state of Rome. So since your your senators would be hiring these men and basically be in charge of these military units, the soldiers were loyal to these specific people. They weren't loyal specifically to Rome, even though they were there to represent Rome. And this is a problem. <laughs> but this is a system that had been going on for a long time before Caesar, so he's not exactly like the first person to be doing this. This is just how things were. Well, I just, when you said that, it just kind of flashed me back, like, fast forward to the future... Not future, but, like, fast forward to, like, the Golden Age of Piracy where you have the Pirates Council, but each of them has, like, their own crew kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I, I don't think it was complete fiction in Pirates of the Caribbean where they have, like, the council of all the different pirates and everything, and they're pretty much, if you're, like, outmatched the table, you have, like, no place because someone can just kind of, like, take your place mm -hmm. and conquer your areas, your ocean or trading routes and what... But, I mean, um... There, there actually, there actually was like a whole <clears throat> league of pirates, like during that golden age of piracy, with like Blackbeard and Calico Jack and his Blackbeard's apprentice. What's the guy's name? Uh, Charles Vane and all of them. Mm -hmm. so and they, they kind of have like their own understanding, like government mm -hmm. setup. 
Yeah. Yes. Well, not all senators in Rome at this point in time, or all politicians for that matter, had their own standing military. A lot of them did. And again, it was that system where their soldiers were loyal to your commander. So it'd be kind of like if you were in the military today, like your commanding officer or like the people above them would be a politician and your loyalty was to that politician because this person was your advocate. They would speak for you. They'd get Mm -hmm. you benefits and all those things. They'd make sure that you earned wages whenever you went on campaign and that your family was well supported back in Rome. So your loyalty was to them. It was not directly to the city of Rome. Also, technically, the Roman Senate at this point in time They don't really make laws. They kind of like suggest them and people just comply with that. But it's not like a set in stone rule. Mm -hmm. And I found this very interesting when it came to like studying Rome in that like today everything's written down. Like there is a law for like everything. If we notice that there's a law missing, they will fill in the gap if they can. Versus they kind of just have like a general understanding and people realize that they should not break certain rules, but the rules weren't like solidified. It was just kind of what everything did. Kind of like the early, like whenever we were starting off the presidency in the United States and that since George Washington only served two terms, everyone after that has only served two terms. Like it wasn't a set rule, but since he did it that way, we followed that practice ever since then. Okay. Kind of like that. But I mean, like... It also seems like a dangerous trap area. Like, oh, it's a terrible very, idea. <laughs> very vague about a law, and like pretty much anything can be encompassed under breaking said law. Like, well, know. even worse of a law is just kind of like a general understanding. Like, mm-hmm. we kind of agree without having to say it that you know you don't do this, you know. But then when someone finally does do it, and you're like, hey, you're not supposed to do that. No one ever does that. That doesn't really have like a a, a hard mm-hmm. standing to it. <laughs> Because there's no law against it, so. But anyway. (laughs) Um, So, before Caesar even became consul, the Roman uh, political system had already been shaken previously. There had been lots of corruption and even wars that were fought over how the system was currently being run and how things were meant to be treated. So, before uh, Caesar was consul, another consul by the name of Sulla was actually in charge. Sulla, and this is a couple generations before Caesar became a consul, but he was alive when Sulla was consul and became the first dictator. So Sulla was from a relatively unimportant patrician family, but had earned respect and position by his skill in defending Rome during the Social War of 89-90. After this, Sulla was sent out again uh, to defeat the king of Mithridates of Greece, who was opposing Roman rule in the east. Sulla again... Uh, succeeded in his task, but during his absence from Rome, enemies in the Roman Senate were conspiring against him. He was declared an enemy of the state, and all rulings and measures he had put in place for Rome were revoked. Instead of this crushing him, Sulla took his massive army by this point and marched on the city of Rome. He removed his enemies and established himself as dictator for life. Now, the dictator for life is a position that was made in the Roman uh, political system, um, which kind of made you a king for a period of time it was meant to only be used under times of particular strife so like um oh my gosh i'm forgetting his name now when the big campaigns were coming and they were approaching the cities the city gates of rome which don't actually exist because there's no gates around rome Mm -hmm. uh oh my gosh spartacus (laughs) when stuff like that goes down when like really bad things are happening they did have this position where some they would elect one central leader who would be in charge of controlling the city and getting things back on the right direction. And they'd basically be given all the powers of a single consul. There wasn't really anyone to contradict them because it was just kind of like, you're the master director, you do everything. Um, But this dictatorship is a temporary appointed position again. However, Sulla was given the position for life because, you know, he kind of had his armies at the the edge of the city and that's kind of a problem. Also, there's no gates surrounding the city of Rome So you can kind of just walk into it. There's no actual, like, reinforced protection here. Um, So Sola took this role and used it to help improve and strengthen the political structures of Rome and that of the Senate. He promised that when he was completed, whenever he completed his measures, he would remove himself from that position so that Rome would return to its old system of a Senate with two consul leaders um, stronger than it had been before. So he's trying to strengthen the power of the Senate so that there is no more interruptions to this old system that they have. He did not want to become emperor. He was just trying to help reaffirm and keep the old system going. Um, So in 79 BCE, Sully, happy with the changes he was able to bring to Rome, stepped down. 
and retired from politics, and he actually died shortly afterwards, um, blissfully unaware that his actions would become the guidebook for overthrowing the Roman Senate. <laughs> and that's where we get Julius Caesar, another man from a, non, a not too powerful patrician family who came abruptly of age during the time of Sulla's movements. I say abruptly as Caesar's father had passed away, which left Caesar as the leader of a household at the young age of 16. But despite these setbacks, he worked hard to establish himself amongst the other Roman leaders and married into an important family of a Roman senator by the name of Lucius Cornelius Cinna. And he married his daughter, who was Cornelia. Wait, so he married into Cinna's family? Yes. Was and Cinna for, or... Okay, Stella was the guy who was... Okay. Yeah, Sulla is the other, the other politician guy. Actually, Senna is an enemy of Sulla. <laughs> we'll get into that. Oh. Uh, so, well, Senna was a part of the old regime that opposed Sulla and his reforms. So when Senna fell, so did Caesar, who wasn't a direct enemy of Sulla, but refused to abandon his wife. So he lost everything, his title, all his positions, he lost his money. Um, and he kind of had to leave the city in case Sulla um, decided, like, you know see, what, I'm the, actually going to off you. I thought you. the biography said that, like, he divorced his wife when, like, her name was tied to political scandal or something, like, so that he wouldn't be dragged down. No, he stayed with this one. Oh, okay. But this isn't, like, his first wife, and she also doesn't live much longer. But, yeah. <laughs> Um, with the loss of all of his other positions, Caesar left to join the army, only returning after Sulla left. Uh, left and then died. Um, after Sulla was gone, Caesar thought, uh, not completely destitute, though not completely destitute, had to start all over again. So he returned to Rome, and he quickly became a very vocal politician, speaking out against corrupt <laughs> officials. It was during this time that he took a journey across the Aegean Sea and was captured by pirates, <laughs> um, who demanded a ransom for his release. So Caesar declared that this ransom was too low, and that the pirates should ask for more money. Um, he also told them if they ever released him that he would return and kill them all, which I'm sure they found hilarious. And, well, he was true to his word. Um, after he was released, he quickly returned with forces and had all the pirates crucified. But he was nice to them. He had their throats cut first and then crucified all of them. Yay, Caesar! <laughs> after this, Caesar continued his military career and started pissing off a lot of people in the Roman Senate he was very popular amongst the people of Rome and his own soldiers. Not only was he very vocal about abuses of power, but he also spoke out for more benefits and favors for the military and lower classes. He also was conquering a lot of territories, not only in Asia, but in other parts of Europe as well. He would push the limits of his authority in different parts of the newly acclaimed territories and ignore declarations and recalls from the city of Rome. This is a problem. Multiple attempts by others in the Roman Senate had been made to slow down Caesar's ever-growing power, but the time of the, by the time of the consul election of 59 BCE, the, most, the more traditional party was actually funding Caesar's opponents, but to no avail. Caesar won the election, and to even more solidify his power, um, he orchestrated a political alliance with very powerful and wealthier Roman senators, Marcus Lucinius Crassus and Gaius Pompeius Magnus, also known as Pompey. This triumvirate was insanely powerful, but at least with this system, it was three dividing of authority instead of just one person. Then Gaul. <laughs> so Caesar wished to push the limits of the empire further than it had ever uh, been to rival the empires of the past, namely that of Alexander the Great. So with all effort uh, plunged into Gaul, this pursuit caused significant damage to Caesar's forces and to his alliance. It also caused huge damage to him monetarily because he was spending so much money just giving it away and also part of his military campaigns. After the passing of his daughter Julia, who had been wed to Pompey to affirm their allegiance and the death of Crassus, Pompey turned against Caesar. Pompey, who had significant forces of his own, was ordered by the Senate to have Caesar throw down his arms and return to Rome. And knowing that complying with this order would most certainly lead to his arrest, Instead of surrendering himself, Caesar marched his forces across the Rubicon River, declaring war on the city of Rome. Pompey and his forces battled with Caesar, but were unsuccessful in their attempt. Upon arrival in Rome, Caesar was declared dictator. He famously pursued Pompey, but never caught him, though he did defeat his forces and those of his sons. Pompey was stopped upon the orders of the young Ptolemy... Mm, that thir that's 13. <laughs> Sorry, I need to not write things in Roman numerals because I always like forget how to count in them for a second. Um, 
But under the orders of a young Ptolemy the Thirteenth, but most likely it was actually his advisors that did this, um, put uh, Pompey to death. This action was thought, um, was thought which the Egyptians saw would please Caesar, actually enraged him, and he ordered the death of all of the assassins. This is during the time that Caesar also met the alluring Cleopatra and favored her leadership in Egypt over that of her brothers, and he actually helped to put her on the throne in his place. Once back in Rome, Caesar began pursuing new rulings, as well as hosting many triumphal celebrations, earning more love from the people of Rome. He started new building projects and allocating public lands to the people. He was showered with honors and titles, declaring him the great leader of Rome, of the Roman people, even declaring Caesar divine. And this is where even those senators that liked Caesar began to question if things had gone too far. Even though Caesar was loved and admired by many and had done many great things for the city of Rome and the empire, one thing that was still greatly feared amongst the sinners of Rome was the idea of a king. And while Sulla took the role of a dictator for life and then agreed to give it up to the senators of Rome, they did not feel the same way about Caesar and what he might do. Sic semper tyrannis, thus always to tyrants. An alleged quote by Senator Marcus Junius Brutus who was present at the assassination. On the 15th of March, uh, 44 BCE, Caesar arrived at the theater of Pompey for a meeting of the Roman Senate and was approached by the other senators, allegedly to discuss a specific case, when he was first grabbed to prevent him from running and then stabbed a total of 23 times with daggers, at least once by uh, one of each of the conspirators, although allegedly at least 60 senators were involved with this plot. This was to show that it was a collective decision as well to defer the blame amongst all party members so one person wouldn't be declared the main assassin. According to a depiction written down by Plutarch Caesar, uh, written down by Plutarch, Caesar covered his face with a loose portion of his toga as he fell to his death, but said nothing. According to other depictions, all written down after the actual event, of course, when Caesar recognized Marcus Junius Brutus at his death as one of his assassins, and said to him, Kai su technon, which is Greek for, and you, child? Which, of course, is taken and transformed into that famous line from Shakespeare's play, Et tu brute, then fall Caesar. While Caesar never, never publicly called himself the king, he didn't exactly stop others who called or depicted him as such. Though allegedly on his last day, when crowds of admirers called him king, he denied the title. After his death, the senators addressed the shocked crowd of people outside the theater before departing. While the senators may have thought that taking out this man, uh, who they thought was such an obvious dictator, the public did not feel the same. At the funeral of Caesar, upon the fire, crowds placed furniture and other objects to fuel it, causing it to spill over and greatly damage the forum. Then, led on by Marcus Antonius, the people marched upon the conspirators' houses enraged. And this is where Shakespeare is inspired to create Mark Antony's famous speech, where it riles the crowds of Rome against the Roman senators. And I'll let Jarrett read that. Oh, okay. <clears throat> oh, God, I hate this <clears throat> Prepare <speech>. yourself. <laughs> you said you wanted to say it. You get to say it. I didn't it. know it was this speech. It's, just, it's that speech, yeah. This is the corny speech that everybody botches. I don't know. Yep. Have fun botching it. They, it's it's be fine. They fun of this so many times. Because it sounds... Give me your ears. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I am come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus has told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it is a grievous fault. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under the leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, honor all honorable men. Come, I speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. I don't think that's the end. I can't scroll. <laughs> there we go. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? 
when that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that the Lupercal I thrice presented him, that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown. Lupercal, yeah, yeah. Valentine's Day. Which he hath thrice refused. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure he is. And sure he is an honorable man. I speak to not I speak not to disapprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me, my heart is in the coffin. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar. And I must pause till it come back to me. There you go. <laughs> Good job. Very, very dramatic. Like yes, very Some dramatic. might say melodramatic. Well, it's Shakespeare, and that's kind of the point. <laughs> that's the point. But I think, um, I mean, and I think he gives uh, Mark Antony maybe too much credit for how good of a speaker he was. Um, it gives a good idea of, like, how you can, like, rile up a crowd, because he's going with just, like, oh, but, you know, Brutus is such a good guy, and Brutus says that he should die, so I guess he should die. But you remember how great Caesar was? And that's basically what he's mm-hmm. doing. <laughs> um and it, I mean, that's not the actual speech he gave, of course, but whatever he said to them, it worked. So uh, they marched upon these senators' houses. Some senators were able to flee and gather forces outside of Rome, but that did not cool the people's anger. As Caesar's heir, Octavian, came to Rome, the people were calling for the remainder of the conspirators to be hunted down. A second triumvirate was now formed with Octavian, Antony, and Lepidus, Caesar's old military commander. And now, with Caesar's army now loyal to Octavian, they rallied around him and declared war on these public enemies, who were all swiftly defeated. Of course, we know from here that the fighting did not stop, as the Second Triumvirate would later fall apart, leading to yet another civil war. But once everything settled down, perhaps out of desire to keep the peace, the Roman government was never the same under the new leadership of Octavian, who now had the name of Augustus, and the Age of Emperors had begun. So, yeah, his he became a martyr for the cause, kind of. Basically, yes. And what's really interesting, too, because a lot of, like, the issues that the Roman senators were having is that um, uh, Caesar was being portrayed as a living god. So mm-hmm. people were starting to be like, oh, he's like a deity. Like yeah, they that's were definitely a problem. They were, uh, what was it? There was, like, a white ribbon sash that they gave him in, like, one of his statues in his hand showing that he was divine. And then he literally gets deified under the age of Augustus. Like, there's actual portraits of Caesar that will then depict him like a god. So, barefoot, you know, all of that stuff in military garb. I was watching his biography, and he did claim that um, on his, on either his, I think on his father's side, like, he was descended from Jupiter. That's really common. A lot yeah. of those patrician families will connect themselves with some sort of god of like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. my great, 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 great auntie slept with, you know, Mars or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm related to Mars. Um, so, yeah, a lot of them did do that. Oh, and you, you will see like that in their portraiture as where. Kind of, yes, yeah. but as long as you weren't saying that you were divine, because, again, that was tying back to that idea of kings, because... Like, Mm -hmm. especially, we're more familiar with it later on, but it had happened before then where kings would say, I'm ordained by, you know, gods or by God, and that's why I'm Mm -hmm. chosen to be the king. That was like an actual thought. (laughs) Pretty much every pharaoh, but like... Yes, yeah, the pharaohs were portrayed as king, uh, gods. So like in, like, prior to like this era, was it common for like Roman kings to be... Mm -hmm. descended from gods yeah to be like divine in some sort of way or related to the divine in some sort of way but yeah these these roman senators were not meant to portray themselves Mm -hmm. that way because even though they did hold a lot of power like i refer to them as an oligarchy and that's how often uh, we would refer to them whenever we were studying rome in history Mm -hmm. um 
it's it's because it's yeah it is like an elected system and everything but you have this very prominent powerful group of people who are the patricians who are like these old aristocratic people who are basically Mm -hmm. ruling over everything and they're keeping their own type of hierarchy but it's it is an elected system so it's not straight up a monarchy and it's not just one person but it is kind Mm -hmm. of more of an oligarchical structure so oligarchy is where like it's a series of like Family, it's like a couple of ruling class. Yeah, families. it's a it's a knit group, um, but it's not just like one leader. It's not one family. And they do have divisions amongst themselves. What was really interesting, and I'll put it in my reading list for all the Assassin's Creed Two stuff that I'm making a massive reading list for. Um, there is this amazing book, uh, and I cannot remember the author right now, but it makes the argument that Rome had political parties very similar to how we have political parties, but not not quite the same. Because I'd hate to compare, you know, because this is an ancient uh, political structure. I'd hate to compare it to something modern day, even though we do take a lot of inspiration from these ancient political structures. Um, But there is an argument that there were, like, political parties even back then. And it kind of worked in that system. And you kind of had your more conservative and you kind of had your more, you know, uh, liberal kind of side as well. But, like, not like like anything like what we have today. (laughs) There was the toga party. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Uh, who would be the other side then? I don't know. Y'all <laughs> wore togas. The sandal so. party. The sandal party. <laughs> <laughs> well, and like the military also held a significant political sway as well. They were almost like their own. Well, they mean there were like in their own interest group that. Uh, senators or people looking to be elected into office would covet and try to get the favor of because if you get the military behind you you're doing pretty good but yeah you had that whole system where the military wasn't directly loyal to the city so when caesar or Sulla was just like let's march upon the city their men are like okay cool we really like you so we'll do this even though that was like the because it used to be you could not have weapons in the city of Rome. If you were an army, you had to lay down your arms. You could not march upon the city of Rome. Mm-hmm. There's no gate. And again, this is not an official rule. It was just kind of, no one ever did this. This is not a thing that you do. Um, and they're like, you know what? Let's march upon the city of Rome. There's no defense. There's no uh, standing army that's going to protect the city. So I'm just going to walk right up there. <laughs> that makes sense, like how it later on became sacked like after yeah yeah. well they do build walls eventually and we are seeing some of them in the game because there was that gate that we talked about that was part of a wall that was added but it was added later on (laughs) so yeah even after like things like oh yeah spartacus and uh uh if you look at the map from brotherhood like the entire city is walled off the part that's not facing the but during ancient rome there were no walls um, because I guess they were just, you know, like, no one's going to touch I us. We're kind of Rome. Like, picture, like, a line of centurions pretty much forming a wall. Mm-hmm. Like, just, like, kind of like a chain link f- fence, just a bunch of shields up. Well, I'm just way. wondering, it's just, like, how many times do you need to have an, an army literally walk up to your gates to be like, you know what, we should probably put a wall up there. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Every other city has one, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it looked nice not having a wall and being able to see the area surrounding the city, but also, hmm. Getting sacked doesn't like sound great. How many times <laughs> the random people, you know, sleeping on your lawn would be like, I should probably put up a fence. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably, a whole hippie circle down. Probably there. put something there. Maybe a <laughs> moat or something. I don't know. A yeah. moat sounds great. I'd love to have a moat. I wish moats were still a thing. Crashing on the petunias, the begonias. <laughs> <laughs> They're ruining my lawn. Mm-hmm. It's getting away from me. (laughs) (laughs) But Um, yeah, that is... And I did really simplify, like, the whole... uh, There's a lot more, like, nuance and details to Caesar and how he became a thing, as well as Sulla. And it's very fascinating, but it's a lot of information. And I didn't want to, like, bombard you with, like, all, like, the the little details of all these little families and everything everyone's doing at a time. And there's just too many people and too many things. I felt a little bombarded. Me personally. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the okay. quickest summary I could get you as to Caesar, who he was, mm-hmm. why he was killed, and what happened. That was very nice. I was joking. There's your Spark now, Notes edition of the assassination of Julius Caesar. So, um, I was thinking, like, several things are coming up. Well, it was interesting that you were pointing out, I think both with, uh, was it Mark Antony? 
the who okay Mark Anthony Octavian what was the difference between them who which one was they're two different people two different <laughs> that's people. the difference okay which one was the one that whose speech I read that was that was Mark Anthony so he was uh, Caesar's second in command and was in Rome with him. And like and part of the story the guy is that, that takes he's up Cleopatra as his mistress after. Yes, so yes. it's like takes Caesar's sloppy seconds. Yeah, yeah. As people say. Well I'm not uh, saying that as what people say. <laughs> there was also like a yeah. part of like Mark Antony was kind of distancing himself from Caesar before this assassination mm-hmm. happens and kind of used his death as like a political tool to be like, This will make me oh, really okay. popular now, because people are gonna see yeah. me fighting for him. See, so. I thought the whole point was like to make himself the next emperor, but then I remember it kind that, of was that he he kind of put um Caesar's nephew who was Octavian up as like the next one. Yes and no. So he did did help out Octavian, and they did form a second triumvirate together. But basically, kind of after the the, the other senator people were taken care of, Mark mm-hmm. Antony kind of tried to strong arm his way into having total control over all of Caesar's assets and tried to mm-hmm. basically take uh, Octavian's uh, inheritance away from him. And that was part of what caused those two to start fighting and for the third civil war to break out. Which by then, everyone's like, "Oh my God, another war? Seriously?" <laughs> well, um. I, I remember a few things from the play, but I don't think we really talked about how uh, Brutus and Cassius, because they're the, they're the chief traitors, mm-hmm. according to, like, history. Yes. Like, all the other senators are pretty much forgotten, but these two, like, there's literally a special place in hell reserved yeah. for them. <laughs> well, because they were friends, and then we got mm-hmm. turned against them. That's why I was talking about. Right. It wasn't just enemies that were involved on this plot, but they're it was like allies the, as well. They're, like, the, um, the uh, textbook example of what a traitor Yes. It's too... Like the ultimate traitor. Like, right. it's okay. It's... I mean, it's not okay. It's not as bad to be betrayed by someone who's already your enemy, but for mm-hmm. someone who is your friend to turn against you is the ultimate betrayal. And like we were saying in the quotes, Brutus is referred to, like he says, and you child or et tu Brute mm-hmm. in the Shakespearean play. It's because Brutus and Caesar were very close to each other and they kind of had like a parent-child or at least like a mentor-mentee type relationship between right. them. So him being involved in on this plot is like the ultimate pinnacle of, wow, you're an asshole <laughs> betrayal. <laughs> And the and the play kind of like shows him like the whole time, even up to the point and after like regretting like kind of yeah. like am I well yeah and, and upon like, like his yeah. death I believe he has like a little soliloquy that he does where he's like basically saying like oh I'm really sorry <laughs> I don't know if we should like pull up things I know that um like like I don't know if we should pull these things up I think that I okay was Brutus executed or was he I believe he killed himself on the battlefield before he was captured I believe. I know that, okay, I know that Cassius is famously, uh, died because he, uh, he didn't have the guts to kill himself, Mm -hmm. apparently, so he pretty much did, like, Caesar and covered his face, and then had, uh, like, what, okay, well, they say he, the phrase, like, he fell on his own sword, Mm -hmm. like, kind of refers to someone who, like, basically goes down fighting for what they believe in but like in his case he literally couldn't like stab himself so he just kind of like I think someone held up a sword or like propped it up and he just kind of fell on it mm-hmm. or he had somebody else like kill him basically like, so he couldn't just stab himself they were, yeah they really wanted to go out of the way to portray well, him mean, as like a coward you know? yeah and it's like I mean I mean you're still killing yourself you're just you know not directly mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know I, I feel like that's a terrifying no matter what aspect is put in. We'd have to look back at because the the play portrays it one way, and exactly, the actual history yeah. is like another way. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Well, I guess that's true too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I thought Brutus died in battle, or something. Or I don't. I don't think he was executed, but it makes sense that he would like. Or like so. killed by an enemy in battle. I I no, he died and on it's a not battlefield. Really like, <laughs> it's like you might say that's a coward's way to go and everything, and it's like, but Brutus didn't strike me as cowardly mm-hmm. at all. It's, like, in spite of him, like, betraying his friend. Like, he pretty much was, like, the play shows, I feel like he was just um, deceived into believing that was the best thing for Rome. And he well, was and of, I think the play also does give them a little bit more credit because they do make the <laughs> arguments about how, what they're actually mm-hmm. fighting for. It's not because, I mean, for some of them it, it is they hate Caesar, they want him dead. For others it's... Mm-hmm. 
they have made a vow as senators that they will not allow uh, kings to return, six emperor Tyrannus. Like, mm-hmm. you know, this is a system that they strongly believe in. It should be upheld in one way, and it should right. not have one central leader. And if someone is going to take that, and you can't stop them, which, I mean, at this point, and as you're seeing from his actions, it's kind of gotten to the point where the people are declaring him king, like, you know, they're saying he's a god, they're yeah, giving him all these things, like, there's lavishing all these titles on him. If you look back... Like, and it like, looks like yeah. it's gotten out of control. <laughs> and it's funny, because, like, if you look back, and Assassin's Creed deals with, like, a lot of tyrants, but, like, all of the biographies, like, on, like, the different um, tyrants that I've seen and everything, is, like, one thing they had in common was they're always, like, starting off as this man of the people kind mm-hmm. of, Very like, charismatic yeah. leader, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, and it's always, like, referred to as charismatic, but it was, like, we... we, Okay, and that word's kind of, like, always associated with tyrants, like, a quality that's associated, like, being very charismatic. It's, like, that doesn't really put into, like, literal terms what JFK is referred to, to as being a charismatic leader, and we don't yeah. consider him a tyrant. No, I mean, it's frequently referred to, like, yeah. like you say, like, like Hitler, Hitler was Hitler, very charismatic, Fidel Castro yeah. was Which very charismatic. Which basically means they're, like, good speech givers and everything. But, like, me, when I hear that, I'm like, okay, I don't see how this guy... Like, because I think... Because at first I associate charismatic with someone who's more, like very uh seductive and everything and i was thinking like okay in what way is this speech seductive like you know and i'm thinking like sexually seductive and everything (laughs) it's like these words like charisma charisma and everything is like a um like a sex appeal trait and everything so it wasn't processing for me what i'm trying to say is (laughs) the fact that um, i don't think hitler got elected because people thought he was sexy (laughs) no but like uh, i guess my juvenile (laughs) mind like in high school was like okay i don't really get how that made him more popular but whatever so what i'm saying is okay yeah pretty much um yeah it and I guess this isn't a surprise to anyone. Dictators and everything start off by giving the people what they want and telling them what they want. And that's like, you know, just follow, mm-hmm. follow Julius Caesar's example to the letter of basically throwing these um, large grand scale spectacles to appease the people in order to basically uh, have them follow you everywhere or pretty much uh, just surrender their. Yeah. Uh, and that's force of will kind of what you. they were yeah. doing. They were mm-hmm. trying, like the what is it, the Laurel or what the the, the, the Antony in that yeah. speech is saying that Caesar turned down. That was literally them like offering him a crown, like here, be king, and he's like, yeah, nah, so here, like, be king, nah. <laughs> yeah, so feigning uh, apathy for the crown or what, whatever you mm-hmm. call it, like basically feigning humility is like a big yes. uh, technique. That was and used. one thing that's very interesting is now when Augustus... Of course, in certain moments, because, I mean, like, very much, like, seem to have these pompous qualities, but, like, in certain in certain settings, like, I know when to... Like, he's like, I know when to play it down and mm-hmm. not be so... Pompous. Well, he didn't play it down enough because the senators yeah. were not buying it, yeah. but... Uh, but then whenever Augustus takes on the, the <laughs> leadership and starts becoming yeah. this emperor, the first emperor of Rome... You know, uh, he takes on titles as being like the father of Rome mm-hmm. and like all these titles. And it takes a while before he's actually literally referred to as being like the emperor. Um, but it ends up turning into this very interesting cycle where a lot of the emperors, whenever you were emperor, uh, you would honor the person who was your predecessor heavily to show kind of like a divine line that's being connecting. So you're not like, look how great I am, look how wonderful I am, look at all these statues I made of myself. It's, no, you remember how really cool my dad was who appointed me, who said that I should be in charge of you? Remember how you felt like Augustus was like God on earth? Yeah, I'm his child. Well, not directly because it's his stepson. But anyway, (laughs) um, and it kind of turned this into this very interesting uh, system where you'd portray the person before you as a deity so augustus you know would be like remember how awesome caesar was do you remember how much you loved him and how cool he was like <laughs> so yeah i feel like that's definitely still houston <laughs> well and literally temples were built in honor mm-hmm. of caesar as well so he was turned into a god <laughs> It's like saying, like, okay, if you were vice president to this person, you're just kind of, like, building up their memory to, like, um, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. Well, and again, going back to the, oh my gosh, I'm going to forget his like name. The glory fast. days of my predecessor who I served under and everything. Yeah, because, um, I was trying to think, trying to think. Was that for whenever Eisenhower? Lyndon B. Johnson, oh, Johnson. Okay. became president after Kennedy? One of the big things he did was talk about how great Kennedy was, and Kennedy chose him as his vice president, which made him become president upon Kennedy's assassination. Excellent. So you just talk about how great the guy before you was. Um, so, and I mean, it worked. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that. Oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, I totally lost track of what I was going to say. Sorry. <laughs> but, um, oh, the funny thing about uh, when we were talking, okay, when we first started going into um, Brotherhood and Ezio just arrived at Rome and then he found Machiavelli and Machiavelli is pretty much um, not really doing his I told you so dance, but just kind of like, you know, uh, after after uh, Monteriggioni was blown to bits by uh, uh, Cesare, whose name means Caesar, <laughs> and mm-hmm. and then uh, and then uh, yeah, and then Ezio has to come to Rome so he can start up like a plan with. Uh, he's basically ha- keeps having this argument with Machiavelli. Machiavelli is like, okay, here's what we're gonna do, like to cut off like Cesare's military and everything, and like Ezio's like, oh, I think we should rely on the people, and people are you know, strong, and they're being oppressed here, and it's, and, uh, <laughs> I can't remember what, uh, Machiavelli keeps, like, saying stuff, one of the quotes that Machiavelli was doing, and I don't know if it's a Machiavelli, Machiavellian quote, but pretty much they, they formed a character around, like, Machiavelli's whole school of thought, which Machiavelli did love to study Rome, and, uh, Roman politics and everything, but, um, what was it, do you remember one of the quotes that Machiavelli was saying about, um, Like, oh, it seems like uh, Rodrigo Borgia has set this thing up. And he's like, it's very clever of him to do so. It it fools your friends, the people, so well, so easily or Mm -hmm. something. He's very cynical about the people. Mm -hmm. And then, like, Ezio calls him out and he's like, I'm just being a realist. And it's like, you, he's like, and he literally says relying on the people is like building your foundations on quicksand. Yeah. He'll love you one day and then hate you the next. (laughs) Well, because we were talking about Nero for at one point in time mm-hmm. as well, and when Nero was first emperor or Caesar, mm-hmm. they really liked him. Yeah. And then it went down from there. <laughs> but yeah, I just is, uh, yeah, Machiavelli's uh, cynicism is very like refreshing. Well, I mean, his entire yeah. book is his cynicism, so yeah. But um, just yeah, basically, him partnered up with Ezio, and it's kind of like it's very much a seeming like reluctant partnership there's several times where we've been through this game and i feel like even up to this point in the book where um uh well as we know la volpe is very skeptical very uh suspicious of machiavelli and his intentions and everything um and it's like we know uh not really where we don't really know where machiavelli's loyalties lie they supposedly to the assassin branch but he also historically is a big admirer admirer of Cesare Borgia so it's like this could go downhill when and I won't say how it turns out because I think that's spoilers but yeah anyway back to Julius Caesar uh one of the quotes that I think I missed that I probably wanted to read off is like the whole one where uh I I want to look up the quote from uh the Julius Caesar play where uh his wife Calpurnia is having the dream of people like washing their hands in his blood fountain. Cause it's great, because he pretty much laughs it off. Ha ha ha, silly woman. So what family Caesar's was Calpurnia house. from? Uh let's see. Does that his like his fourth wife or something? <clears throat> yeah, something like that. He has a lot. <laughs> Like, no wonder he's not going to take her seriously. <laughs> just, <laughs> you're just another wife. That's horrible. Ouch. <laughs> well, it doesn't seem like he takes the institution of marriage very seriously. Yeah, she's the so. fourth wife. So I don't think he would take her seriously. Because Cornelia died, and then he married Pompeia, and then divorced her, and then he married uh, Calpurnia, and then he died. And Calpurnia outlived him. Uh, Good see. for her. 
<laughs> it's like Henry VIII, divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Let's not bring that back up. Well, I won't bring the song back up. That's exactly what he brought up. <laughs> okay, okay, so fine. for Jared, we're going to do this scene between Caesar and his wife when she's trying to caution him against going to the Senate house because <laughs> Jared loves this scene so much. He is going to be reading for Calpurnia and Brutus. I'm going to be reading for Caesar and the servant. Just stuck in my mind so much. So, scene two, Caesar's house. Thunder and lightning enter Caesar in his nightgown. Caesar, nor heaven nor earth have been at peace tonight. Thrice hath Capernia in her sleep cried out. Help, ho, they murdered Caesar. <laughs> Who's within? <laughs> Enter a servant. Servant, my lord. Caesar, go bid the priests do present sacrifice and bring me their opinion of success. Servant, I will, my lord. He exits and enters Calpurnia. Uh-huh. I see how you talk to your wife, Caesar. <laughs> I see. What? How? <laughs> Enter. Calpurnia. What do you mean, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? You shall not stir out of this house today. Caesar. Caesar shall forth the things that threatened me never looked but on my back. When they shall see the face of Caesar, they are vanished. Calpurnia. Caesar, I never stood on ceremonies, yet now they fright me. There is one within... Besides the things that that we have heard and seen, recounts most horrid sights seen by the watch. A lioness hath whelped in the streets. The graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. Fierce, fiery warriors fought upon the clouds in the ranks and squadrons from the right form of war, which drizzled blood upon the capital. The noise of the battle hurtled in the air. Horses did neigh, and dying men did groan, and ghosts walk and shriek and squeal about the streets. O oh, Caesar, these things are beyond all use, and I do fear them. Caesar, what can be avoided? Whose end is purposed by the mighty gods? Yet Caesar shall go forth, for these predictions are to the world in general as to Caesar. Calpurnia, when beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth death of princes. Caesar, cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never tasted of death but once. Of all the wonders that I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death a necessary end will come when it will come. Re-enter servant. What say the augurers? Servant, they will not have you to stir forth today, plucking the entrails of an offering forth. They could not find a heart within the beast. Caesar, the gods do this in shame of cowardice. Caesar should have should be a beast without a heart. If he should stay at home today for fear, no, Caesar shall not. Dangers know full well that Caesar is more dangerous than he. We are two lions littered in one day, and I, the elder and more terrible, and Caesar shall go forth. Calpurnia, alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house and not your own. We'll send Mark Antony to the Senate house, and he shall say you are not well today. Let me upon my knee prevail in this. Caesar. Caesar, sorry. Mark Antony shall say I am not well, and for thy humor I will stay at home. Enter Decius Brutus. Here's Decius Brutus. He shall tell them so. Decius Brutus. Caesar, all hail. Good morrow, worthy Caesar. I come to fetch you to the Senate house. Caesar, and you are come in very happy time to bear my greetings to the senators and tell them that I will not come today. Cannot is false, and I dare not, falser. I will not come today. Tell them so, Decius. Calpurnia, say he is sick. Caesar, shall Caesar send a lie? Have I in conquest stretched mine arm so far to be afraid to tell graybeards the truth? Decius, go tell them Caesar will not come. Decius Brutus, most mighty Caesar, let me know some cause, lest I be laughed at when I tell them so. Caesar, this cause is in my will, I will not come. That is enough to satisfy the Senate. But before you private satisfaction, because I love you, I will let you know. Calpurnia here, my wife, stays me at home. She dreams tonight she saw my statua, 
which, like a fountain with a hundred spouts, did run pure blood, and many lusty Romans came smiling and did bathe their hands in it. And these does she apply for warnings and portents, and evils eminent, and on her knee hath begged that I will stay at home today. Okay. You see, Brutus, they want my husband's body. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I should have her committed. <laughs> <laughs> Decius Brutus. This dream is all a myth interpreted. It was a vision fair and fortunate. Your statue spouting blood in many pipes, in which so many smiling Romans bathed, signifies that from you great Rome shall suck, reviving blood, and that men shall press for tinctures, stains, relics, and cognizize. This by Calpurnia's dream is signified. I don't know how that makes it any better. <laughs> but anyway, Caesar, and this, why have you well expounded it? Yeah, didn't deny that he's going to die. He just said that, well... No, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> Decius Brutus, I have when you have heard what I can say. And, now, and know it now, the Senate have concluded to give this day... A crown to mighty Caesar. Look at the crown. Look at the crown. Go get that crown. Don't you want it? If you shall send them word, you will not come. Their minds may change. Besides, it were a mock apt to be rendered for someone to say, Break up the Senate till another time, when Caesar's wife shall meet with better dreams. If Caesar hide himself, shall they not whisper, Lo, Caesar is afraid? Pardon me, Caesar. For my dear love to our proceeding bids me to tell you this, and reason to my love is liable. Ooh. <clears throat> Caesar, how foolish do your fears seem now, Calpurnia? I am ashamed I did yield to them. Give me my robe, for I will go. What? 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 <laughs> and look where Publius, Publius come to fetch me. Publius. Publius? Publius. <laughs> Publius. <laughs> that, uh, the name only a mother could love. <laughs> Brutus, Ligerius, Metellus, Casca, Trebonius, and Cinna. They all just came into his bedroom while he's like, and it's like this is kind well, of. Well, they're a in his fest. house. They don't yeah. share a room together. I'm okay. assuming. It seemed like they just came into his bedroom. <laughs> Caesar. And all these dudes just walked into your room like, "Hello, morning." You're still like, in your wife, <laughs> wife just kind of pulls on her robe. I'm in my nighty. Get out. Get out. I saw Caesar bleeding from multiple spouts. Um, we're not going anywhere today. I feel like if this was a conversation and if I had it with my boyfriend, I would just be like, no, I'm going to lock you in the house. <laughs> 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 Take it to the next level of crazy. <laughs> if you honestly think that they're going to die, I mean, like, nope, you're not going anywhere. Sorry. Quarantine. But yeah, do love Calpurnia. <laughs> She's pretty much, and I feel like I did that, that uh, kind of, her bewilderment kind of, yeah, justice, because, I mean, that's that's pretty much how she would react. She doesn't speak the rest of the time. She just kind of, like, she's been cowed into shame for telling him that she had bad dreams. So, <laughs> so she's pretty much, like, just at a loss to deal with Caesar at this point. Just be, just be like, fine, go die, have fun. Don't worry about me. I'll be at my sister's. Yeah, love Calpurnia to death. Um, I don't know what became of her after that, but I mean, she's Caesar's widow, so it seems like she'd be well cared for, you know, and everything. But um, unlike unlike Brutus's wife, I don't believe she killed herself. No, she did not. Right, Brutus's wife, as we know, I think as we mentioned before, swallows coals. Swallows hot coals, because you know what better way to go? Like, I guess she didn't have any poison. Jesus woman. <laughs> Sorry. Tis, tis a very brutal way. Keep all to the do sharp that. objects away from her. Keep uh, keep all the you know. Well, I mean, Cleopatra's thing yeah. was like, oh, bring me a snake. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, and then people suspect that her assassination was they just put a snake in there. Like, mm-hmm. and she didn't know it was going to be there. Well, I mean, because her fear was being paraded through the streets in a victor- uh, victory oh, march yeah. after mm-hmm. being killed as her sister was 
whenever her sister was defeated, and she didn't want that to happen to her. Because the Romans were known to do right. that. If, like, they defeated a king or queen or whatever of another land, they would parade them through the streets, you know, and mm. have people throw stuff at them and stuff like that before executing them. And that was, like, a great shame, and people didn't want to be publicly executed. So, yeah, That's why a lot of the uh, conspirators times also they, committed yeah. suicide before they mm. could be captured as well. And then the ones that were captured were executed. Well, that's why I was saying Brutus isn't so much a coward because he's like, you know, there's the horrible things that happen to people like mm-hmm. uh, during executions and everything. It's like, you know, not only it's like uh, pretty much like designed to wipe out any semblance of personal dignity that you have too yeah because so. i mean you're you're making an example and also trying to set a thing where it's just like and if you do this this is what's going to happen to you yeah. you're going to be not just killed you're going to be publicly shamed and you know all these things are going to happen that are going to be a big detriment to your honor so so yeah so i pretty much this is the end of our julius caesar episode we guys hope you enjoyed it I, and you enjoy the rest of your ides of march you're right um and be yeah beware of the Ides of March. Watch out for like the omens, the lions whelping in the streets and the graves yawning. And the if a group <laughs> of your friends like walk start to surround you all of a sudden, red flag. Your it's, fake friends. Yeah, 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 yeah. Your frenemies and your actual friends. Yeah, Watch out for problem. your fake friends today. <laughs> 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 That's some horrible <laughs> advice. Now everybody's gonna like turn on there. Like now, just just be grateful that you're surrounded by true friends and not fake ones Mm -hmm. this day and that you're not wanting to become emperor of rome that's the best way to celebrate yeah don't try to like um declare yourself supreme dictator of anything today yeah today is like the worst of days to have that happen yeah do it tomorrow or the next day or next week even just to be safe right don't don't go to any senate houses (laughs) (laughs) don't go to any what uh roman theaters Yeah. yeah any theaters yeah, it was, it was, it was the theater of Pompey. Yeah, yeah, I guess no plays on the 15th. No plays and no movies, so you can't go and, like, what if you had plans? Now now they're dashed. Yeah. I you mean, can watch Julius Caesar if you really want to. It's bad enough people have to, like, avoid, like, Friday the 13th two days ago, but now it's, like, this one that's going to hit you as well. Yep. Watch out. And, and we also had, like, a full moon last week as well. Oh, great. Just Yeah. Just, just layering it on. Just, uh, March is great. <laughs> even if you're not superstitious, just kind of be conscious of all these mal omens that are swarming around. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is bad, especially like in the middle of a pandemic to say. It's oh. like, yeah. But um, now, this was purely just an episode that we did out of fun for yep. uh, in remembrance of uh, not so much Julius Caesar, but I mean, it is remembrance of Julius Caesar. And it's remembrance of, like, a major historical event and, mm-hmm. a, and a turning point of things. And one that we all, like, know about, because, mm-hmm. I mean, if you were, if you had to read Julius Caesar when you were in school, or I think just most people know it. Like, people know, like, the mm-hmm. Etu Brute reference, at least, if nothing else. Right. Um, but they, maybe not the causes <laughs> that led up to that moment. So, I guess it should be remembered by, um, I guess not... Like, by, like, it, it, okay. I was about to say something like ignoring your haters and not ignoring <laughs> so much to where you're, like, blind. Like, yeah. But, um, be like, Julius, you're all just haters. I'm going to be dictated. Oh, my gosh. I really want to do that quote now from Mean Girls. We should definitely just kill Caesar. <laughs> what did she say? Uh, cause it's, uh, Gretchen Wieners, whenever she finds oh. out that, or, like, when the, she thinks that, um, uh, what's her face, like, the main Queen Bee girl is, like, favoring other people, and then she just, like, she's supposed to give this presentation on Julius Caesar, and she just, like, goes into this long rant about how, like, Brutus is just as cute as Caesar, and we should totally just stab Caesar! <laughs> <laughs> That's actually probably the That's, best like, the quote. end of the quote, but it's, like, it's, it's the best scene. I love that movie, love even Gretchen now. Wieners. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, that that concludes the episode. I guess I'm so terrible at wrapping up episodes. I will say that in future we will be dealing with more Julius Caesar. As um, I thought about bringing it up because the Ides of March is an event in Assassin's Creed history that will come up. But as you all n- should probably know and can guess, um, there's a game... It's in Assassin's Creed Origins, which is a long way off. That's the seventh main title in the series. And to avoid spoilers, we are not talking about 
what actually goes on. We do know from the letters that we've gotten in this game that, and you know, just from knowing our history and our Shakespeare, that Julius Caesar is assassinated by Brutus, being one, the main one to murder him. Um, but is that a spoiler for the upcoming game, though? No, not if it's literally like dramatic irony. Oh, okay. Because the game even expects everybody to know what happened to Julius Caesar before it happens. And even Cleopatra. Hmm. So you're going to see the game's portrayal of those events when we eventually do get to Assassin's Creed Origins. And it's not a spoiler right now because it happened 2,000 years ago. <laughs> right. If it's a spoiler, you need to wake the fuck up. <laughs> you need to yell at your English teacher, your history teacher, one of those teachers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. But thank you guys for listening. I um, hope you enjoyed this special episode. Uh, we got really excited for doing it, and I loved doing all the little artworks and stuff and the theme. Yeah, I really like the, the yeah. Laurel Reefs logo. That was cool. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, um, we should get some, like, Caesar coins and just toss them out everywhere. <laughs> Start throwing <laughs> Laurel Reefs everywhere. Special giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone wants to make a Laurel crown for us, we'd love it. Mm-hmm. No, I was saying, like, we'll be giving out, like, laurel wreath crowns to the lucky winner is the first one. But yeah. I want a crown. That would be funny. <laughs> but you have to deny it three times. Yep. <laughs> okay. That's it. I'm out of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for listening. I uh, hope you have a happy Ides of March. But just remember, if your significant other has a dream about your statue spewing out fountains of blood and people dipping their hands in it, They're cray-cray. Just relax. You're just experiencing the bleeding effect. effect.